Yes, hello, and welcome to the session on leveraging emergency quality assurance technology to drive the customer experience here at the PACE ACX 2021 virtual summit. Here in this session, we're endeavoring to discuss the technology and the customer experience and how it continues to evolve within contact centers, uh, searching to provide tailored solutions to their businesses to the next level. Uh, you'll learn some of the emergent technology, the design and delivery of world-class performance through positive customer and agent experiences that add value to your brand. So I'm your moderator. I'm John Heriberta. I represent iConnective. Uh, we are a keystone of the U.S. telecommunications industry, managing telephone numbers, common short codes, and other services, including trusted communication enablement of enabling brands to bring trust and knowledge of their brand to their customers. We then have joining us uh, first, we have uh, Shane Jackson, who is the founder and CEO of Knowledge Rhino. Shane is a contact center owner and consultant for uh, over 25 years of executive leadership, uh, providing solutions and strategies to drive business growth and efficiencies. In a relentless pursuit of results, he understands the nuances of customer experience and what it takes to deliver on that excellence. Shane also is recognized, uh, recognizes the devil is in the details and that detail is the data. And so today's businesses uh, have issues of, of sizes and, and scale to harness the Glee technology uh, forever dot for lasting successes. Uh, by focusing on the contact center operations, the customer experience a strategy, Shane pinpoints the problems uh, that hold businesses back from uh, underperforming agents, low key performance indicators, and unidentified customer journeys, score calls, and SOP documentation. Next, we have Dan Doherty. Uh, he's the founder and managing partner of Untangle. Dan also has uh, quite a breadth of experience over 20 years in operational uh, executive uh, experience in building large and scale uh, progressive organizations in over 10 countries. Uh, for more than 15 of those years, Dan's been passionately aligning human machine interactions in a way to dramatic, dramatically improve the customer journey. His operational background coupled with unlimited uh, analytical curiosity has placed him in a position to guide brands through the complexity of today's customer experiences. Clients that have partnered with Dan find a wealth of knowledge and practices that aid them in organizing the data processes that elevate their customer and employer, employee experiences while limiting the liabilities, reducing costs, and improving the revenues. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining. Thank Thanks you. for having us. So in this session, I think we have a, a kind of great overall uh, outline, trying to look at the, the enablement of speech analytics in managing the customer experience. And you know, we'll look at some of the common technologies, the myths that people have heard about it, implementation problems and issues, uh, and then where the industry is going. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of lead right in. The first uh, question I would have is, you know, what would be a myth of the customer experience using a voice analytics? I, I, I think it's a panacea. It's got to solve all problems. Is that right, Shane? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, some of the things that uh, that I've heard in the past is, uh, we, you know, when, when talking about speech analytics or or trying to talk to organizations about moving away from traditional QA processes and standards into a speech analytics is, um, I think my favorite is, uh, you know, we, we use speech analytics, we tried it and it didn't tell us anything we didn't already know. And, um, and, and that's probably a more common theme than, uh, than people think. I mean, speech, speech is a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, and, and you can, you know, it's very powerful, but if it's not used correctly and, and you don't understand, have the patience for it, uh, it can be frustrating. Uh, so those are one of the things that, as we talk through this uh, later on uh, this afternoon, is you know understanding how to implement the, how to implement a, a good speech program, you know, what your goals and objectives are, uh, you know, uh, going into it, and then you know what what resources do you need to allocate uh, to make it uh, to make it effective. Anything to add to the list there, Dan? No, I think Shane covered it well. I think it's a technology that's easy to understand, but um, often hard to, to operationalize. Well, that's what I have to assume, right? The, you know, 
we have some experience with artificial intelligence and data analytics. And honestly, the, the hardest part is, is the, act, the collection of the data and then finding somewhere to store it and then understanding the results you're looking for. I mean, it's, it's not an easy solution, is it, Dan? No, yeah, it's, it's definitely, there's a lot of pieces of the puzzles put together when you talk about the integration points and where you get metadata from, not just where you get the call audio from. And then um, now, now we have a bunch of words and there's a certain level of accuracy at that. And, you know, if anybody's talked to Siri on their phone or um, I don't want to <laughs> say the words, so what's sitting on my desktop because um, the Amazon product will start talking to me, but, you know, we don't always get all the words right. So there's, you know, uh, exercises you need to do to build phrase accuracy and, and tune that. And then um, business changes, especially in customer experience and contact center. So, so things change. It's, it's a continual kind of process. Or I, I think it's akin to buying a pool. You know, you, you're going to have to maintain the thing for the life of it. It's not just you, you buy it and start enjoying it the next day and never do another thing. So you're telling me that you can't just go to a vendor and have this drop in your company and then leave? Is that what yeah, you're no, saying, Shane? <laughs> or did? Yeah, no, that's that's for sure. And you know, not that not, not that it happens, but it, but you know, the, the challenge is is that you know the the speech organizations uh, that are out there, and and I think Dan and I um, we're agnostic uh, to them. I mean, they all uh, have their pros and cons. Um, some are easier to use than others. Um, reporting, I think they all start to understand that reporting has been kind of a, a weak spot for them. So they're, they're making changes there. But, you know, just the, the, the nuances in, in the, like Dan talked about the phrase accuracy. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of variables when you start putting information into speech. You've got, you know, is it a mono uh, channel? Is it dual channel? Is it stereo? That affects the accuracy. The transcription rates are, are affected uh, by that. Uh, you have to teach it, so it's a machine. So you have to you have to have a what they call an you know an internal dictionary. And so when it hears words, you know it may transcribe words that are that don't even look like uh, you know monitoring could be mentoring things like that. So you have to teach it when it sees this. This is what it's supposed to be, and then though, then over time it becomes more and more accurate. Um, and those are the those are some of the challenges, and that's what takes takes time uh, time up front uh, you know to to make the thing. Uh, um, you know, effective. You know, you've got diarization, which is the the channel uh, segmentation, right? So you've got a, you know, some are better than others at that as well. So that all that means is, you know, can it uh, disseminate uh, the speaker, you know, the customer from the agent? Um, mm. So there's a lot of variables that go into this over over time, and it just takes a, a little bit of uh, patience and effort to to make it work. Once it once it's up and running, uh, it's extremely powerful uh, application. It sounds like it, but but I guess Dan, it sounds like there's a lot of complexity of real time processing. So I mean, is real time really a value, or is like post call analytics and guidance a little more effective from what you've seen? Yeah, I, I think I have a point of view on this, and, and my point of view maybe differs from a, a lot of folks in the industry today. But I, in real time, I think there are effective use cases for real time speech analytics, and those would be. Um, translation, some of that's working good in the larger cloud companies now, you know, they're nailing that or um, very specific intent detections that we're doing in real time. But the way I look at it is that, you know, I've spent a lot of time with agents over the years and um, was one for, for a while and definitely coached a few. And I don't think that if I'm a human or the agents I knew and I'm watching a screen and I have a script or whatever, and that there's always going to be some lag in this, right? Because you can't say the word and have it change immediately. So even if it's a few milliseconds, 500, 300 milliseconds, um, the, the information contextually that comes on the screen to change, like say a real-time script, that I think that's more noise and distracting to the experience and the agent than it would be a help. But if I look in like sales scenarios and I have a, a list of offers and maybe I'm hearing some specific intents, I'm selling for a specific ISP or maybe I'm in a retention group for a specific ISP and I hear a competitor's name uh, mentioned, now maybe my offer matrix can flip or my knowledge base changes um, mm -hmm. contextually. That makes a ton of sense to me for real-time speech analytics. And um, honestly, real-time, I think, is an emerge. you know, this was an idea and people demoed it five, 10 years ago, but compute power has gotten to the place now. And, and some of the stuff Shane was talking about, I see is almost a commodity now. And, you know, we'll, we'll Google and Facebook and um, Salesforce and Microsoft, all those guys are going to be able to detect very common intents pretty quickly. And they're programming that. So those things become kind of faster, better. And then how do you use it and integrate that into your desktop, your CRM or your dialer, whatever it may be. Very interesting. Shane, what's your thoughts on this real-time versus post-call processing discussion? 
Yeah, you know, the, the the agent desktops right now are so busy to begin with. I mean, they're, we, you know, we've got multiple CRMs they have to navigate. They've got scripting issues. I mean, so what Dan's talking about is is spot on, right? If you, you know, if you if it can help you drive a better conversation, that's that's one thing. Um, but 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 on the coaching side of how I, I don't I'm not a big fan of, of you know coaching like on the spot like right there. What's, and I go back, I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth on this, on this topic. It, <laughs> when you start looking at, uh, start looking at things like supervisors, you know, like request for manager, request for supervisor. Those are things that I, we did this for a client. I'm like, you want to see, you want to see something scary. The number of times that a, a, a customer has asked for a supervisor, uh, you know, if you start processing, you know, 10,000, 50,000 calls, you'd be shocked at how many times that actually comes up versus listening to it on a manual uh, process. So, so, you know, the other side of that is if somebody's asking for a supervisor uh, or a manager and, and the call starts taking, you know, going sideways, real-time analytics can alert a supervisor or a manager that, Hey, you know, uh, you know, Shane's got a problem with this call. It needs to be addressed right away versus letting it, uh, you know, escalate. So, you know, I go back and forth on it. Yeah. I would, I'd add one more thing here, kind of just Shane sparked a thought for me is the, um, when we talk about coaching and development of the reps on the floor, you know, we're looking for a specific kind of consistency there. And that's, that's what we think drives excellence in customer experience. We've talked about that and a large, large mission for most of us is caring for a brand and making sure we have consistent interactions for all the contact centers that may be located in, you know, various geographies with different backgrounds and different tenures of agents and all those things. So I, I see speech as being a good equalizer for that because we're able to go to folks. And when I grew up, when you coached, you'd go to somebody, you'd say something like, Hey, I noticed in your last call, you didn't do this. And the immediate reaction, Action for most people was, well, I usually do that, but I didn't do it on that call. Now, if we're using the aggregated post-day speech, we're able to say, I listen, you know, the system listened to a hundred of your calls or a thousand, and, and you've done this 50 times, so you clearly can do it. You have the skill to do it. Now, let's talk about why you're not doing that on every call or, you know, what types of issues or motivation um, factors may be driving um, your decisions not to do it consistently or may just not be aware. So just making agents aware of what they're doing and how frequently they're doing it. You'll see, you'll see a lot of behavioral change there that can really drive KPIs and ROI ultimately. So I kind of picked up something in your conversation. It, 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 I guess my assumption was originally this was a sampling of calls. It sounds like the preference is to look at all traffic and all voice communication back and forth to kind of process all of that. Is that more accurate? Well, yeah, I mean, here's, here's, yes, the, the short answer is, yeah, you can, you know, speech enables you to listen to whatever, you know, you can ingest a hundred percent of your calls. Uh, I don't normally recommend that. I mean, right now what's happening in the industry and it's happened for, you know, years and years is you're li listening to under a half a percent of calls. You know, you, you know, you've got a one to 35, one to 45 ratio of QA agents to, to call center agents. And sometimes that goes to one to 80. I mean, who knows, you're, you're always trying to create efficiencies in the call center. And, and there's a lot of bias uh, on QA agents. I mean, I, I you know, my, I get on my soapbox all day long and talk about the efficiencies <laughs> of, uh, of uh, standardized QA in the call center. But um, if you're listening to under a half a percent or under 1%, of your calls right now and they're random, uh, even if you listen to 20%, even if you ingest 20% or 25%, you're getting a, you're, you're, you're getting a far greater um, insight into what's going on than you are currently. And, and the, it, but you still need human intelligence for this. So you still need human beings to start going through and listening to calls and, and teaching, the pro, teaching the speech analytics what to listen for, keywords, phrases. So, so by no means uh, are we saying, uh, you know, humans need to be replaced by, you know, the cyborg machines of, of the future. Um, they work, you know, a, a really good QA program integrates human intelligence with uh, speech analytics. Um, and then on the back end, then you have an analyst and, and things like that. So my, you know, the thing that, that Dan taught me a long time ago is you take the QA agents who are currently today and you change their role into more of an analyst type person versus mm. someone who's just checking the box and going through and, you know, did, did Shane actually use empathy and say hello and address the customer by their name? And that's all great and stuff, but let's, let's really use speech what it's meant for is finding out what is going on with the customer and why they're calling and how we can change that behavior. Yeah. yeah Dan, you want to add anything to that? 
uh, maybe a case study real quick. You know, I, I have a Six Sigma background and I worked at a large BPO and led the analytics divisions there. And one of the things we probably had three, 400 folks in the Philippines doing sales verifications for large accounts, for large brands. And um, we, we'd use a lot of statistics and, you know, there's a lot of good practices out there you can use just in normal operations like Six Sigma that would drive that down. I think we used to, you know, for every brand, maybe, you know, for every thousand reps, we had 16 verifying QA reps, something like that. And they, they'd look at, you know, for every thousand evaluations, maybe they find cancellations of sales at a 3% rate. So what is that? Like 20, 30, 30 cancellations for every thousand calls they found, right? When we brought speech in, we were able to drive that team down to four people, pay them more, empower them more and get insights and, and like line of business level intelligence of what was going on. And, and then we were finding um, 30 cancellations in every hundred calls. So, you know, we could find the same needles in the haystacks with, you know, way mm -hmm. less effort. And we're finding more needles are all the needles. You know, I don't know if we got 100% of them, but, you know, we definitely found more of those, those defects. So when you think about things like compliance and do not call lists and all these types of regulatory, um, regulatory things that, you know, it only takes one to sink your brand or get in the newspapers in the wrong way. Um, speech can really help you zero in on that piece. So you bring up a great point. So, so then, so the speech can be used to help change the scripts that maybe the agent uses or the, the paradigm that the, that the brand is using to communicate, correct? So you can help them guide them to better compliance and the like as well, right? Is that yeah. where you're going? Yeah, down? I think so. Yeah, you can see, I mean, in the, in the past, we'd roll out a new script, but you didn't really know how often people were using it, right? You'd kind of QA it, so it changed 0.2 per person per week. And I think for effectiveness in scripting as well, it, it makes sense because if you do A, B split testing on scripts or something like that, again, the compliance of the people actually reading it is, is an unknown unless you start to measure it. And how do you measure that? You know, listen to every call. And, and then the ROI. So, so how does, how does this get pop, you know, I guess calculated into the return on investment of putting in a system like this, Shane? I mean, is this something that can be quantified easy or is it a, an, an estimation, a, a, a oh my, mile post? My, my favorite, my favorite topic is ROI. I mean, this is, this, this is something that, you know, uh, you know, goes all the way back to, I, I did a, a speech a long time ago on, on customer journey mapping, which is the same thing. It's like, you know, it's one of the top uh, drivers. I think Harvard Business Review did a survey um, uh, a year or so ago about what are the top drivers and, and CEOs and, and C-suite execs are, are highly focused on how do we get our customers better service? What's happening? And, and that was the number one driver. Like everybody was focused on it. And then they go back and go to their internal teams like, okay, we all need better service. We all need to provide better service to our customers. How do we do it? And a million different ideas will come out uh, of, uh, in the room. And then it's like, okay, they all cost some money. We need resources. We need technology. And then what's the ROI on them? You know? And so I get on another, my, one of my bigger soapboxes is, is NPS uh, scores and the effectiveness of it, right? It's like, okay, so tell me, somebody proved to me that uh, you know, a 5% jump on NPS score is going to really do, you know, really, really, really solve your, your problems. Uh, and I expect to get 1 million emails on this. I, the last time I did it on Twitter, <laughs> I, I got just blasted. So, uh, but it's the, same, it's the same problem I have with QA scores, right? Like why do you, okay, so so-and-so, our, our standard is 90% or 92% or whatever, that's a passing grade. Okay, so if somebody gets an 84, are they a worse agent than someone got a 92? So, so I, the, the whole scoring system to me is just, uh, is just out of whack and I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, but, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, again, I'm going down a, down a million different rabbit holes uh, on this thing. But, well, not, uh, not really, right? Because uh, I, guess, I guess, Dan, it, it pulls back into the idea of, you know, there's many ways to drive revenue in a business, right? And like you said, that 84% one chain you mentioned, maybe making closes and bringing in new revenue or making a retention. But the guy who get, who's getting 96 is constantly not selling, right? So that's part of your statistics and analysis to, that you could perform and have the voice statistics to back it up, right? That's, that's kind of the value here. Yeah, I, I think there's kind of three, there's three main ways I kind of see people um, look at ROI on the tool. One is driving revenue. One is reducing costs, like labor costs, kind of like what I said in the last example with mm -hmm. the, you know, changing the, the labor ratios. And then um, 
the the other way a lot of people do reducing cost, and the other one is liabilities. You know, reducing liabilities for that. What they may call, you know, two fines from CMS for a, a, medic, a regulated Medicare provider may be, you know, worth the system mm-hmm. on its own or something. But um, when, the other piece on the would be labor costs when we talk about cost reduction. So one of the most key metrics that you know, you'll see this most of the big speech platforms will sell in their initial sales pitches on this percent silence concept, you know, let's shave 10 seconds of HT off kind of a thing. And you, you absolutely can do that. And a lot of times that's, you know, if you, if you have 20 reps, it's probably not going to work for you, but if you have 2000 reps, that's probably going to get you there. Something like that. They're scaling. Yeah. Yeah. Anything I, to add, I, I think, yeah. I think another, you know, another ROI is if you start looking at, uh, you know, inbound sales, inbound retention, outbound sales, things like that, you, you, you could start to drive ROI pretty quickly by changing agent behaviors. You know, if, so if, if so, someone's calling in, you know, especially on the, on the inbound retention side where we focus a lot on is you, customers didn't just wake up and, you know, decide they were done with your ISP or they were done with your, you know, your telco provider. They, they, didn't, ju- they didn't just wake up and do this. Something happened along the way. So where we want to focus it is on, we want to focus it on the customer service side, the initial call, when they call in, what are the key words, what are the key words and drivers? Things like I've called four times and this is still not uh, mm. fixed or this continues to be a problem or, you know, those are, those are the things that you find way ahead of time. Don't let it brew up over four or five, six months. And, and those are some of the analysis that we've done is we, we look at people who have canceled uh, a service and then we backtrack you know, how many times have they called before? What has, what has gotten to this point? And how many um, opportunities were missed, right? To save that customer previous to this leaving, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, companies spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on, on, um, on surveys and CSATs and trying to understand what's, what's, what's going on. Take, you know, take some of those monies and put it into, um, you know, the, the, the speech analytics and, and find out what's happening ahead of time. You know, you can, you should be able to predict uh, CSAT NPS scores from, you know, from just speech analytics. You, you can get a good feel, you know, why, why wait, you know, uh, you know, 30 days after you talk to somebody to send out an, an email survey or an after call survey where you get four or 5% response rate or maybe a 10% response rate on some good cases uh, of which people who, you know, certain people respond to surveys and certain people will not. Speech analytics gives you ability to you take away all the bias uh, of that, and you can understand what's going on with the customer uh, sentiment just through that alone. And we're kind of okay, sorry. Jim, yeah, we're we're kind of speaking around this thing too that I think ties back to some of the earlier questions on the implementation and the usage of it. Speech is powerful. It's way more powerful if it's one tool in the tool belt. And it's integrated and you're using all the metadata from these other systems together, you know? So to me, speech probably can drive its own ROI on its own, but really what it does is it enables some of the other tools that you may have in your tech stack Mm. to take them even further to learn more about it. So, you know, we have these CSAT surveys that to Shane's point, we've invested all this money with Qualtrics or Medallia or whoever. And now how do we figure out what actually happened in those transactions? Okay, well now, how do we build that at scale versus the two, the two interactions that we saw from those surveys or whatever? You right. know, again, it's a surveys are what a two to ten percent return rate, and speech can can kind of take that and model it out and make it um, you know extrapolate that. So it sounds like you know the speech analytics is is quite a dynamic and powerful set of information to use, right? Um, I can only imagine it's going to get even more complicated than what we talked about originally. Like, so what's what's coming next? Where do you see the industry going? Uh, Whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I don't mind. So, I mean, I think there's some of those real-time use cases. I think those are going there. A lot of it, I think, is the commoditization of the platform. So the cost becoming less, uh, you know, kind of less of a, um, a factor and how much you can do. So you talked about that earlier, you know, it used to be maybe it's more expensive. So you sampled 50% of your calls. Now, does it make sense to do hundred because um, the costs have come down in, the, in that? To me, and where, where I'm spending a lot of my time right now is how do we use the speech generated data set to power other pieces in the workflow of the customer experience or the contact center. So Mm. um, abstracting that data in a way that can be consumed by day one rep 
and what does that mean to them? And then how do, how do they change their behaviors on that? And it's not, you know, we can't just give them a great big dashboard with 19 metrics. And even if we call it a balanced scorecard and hope they're going to do something, how do, how do we use speech plus the other data sets to truly find the most impactful thing that they should be doing and then serve that up in a way that empowers that employee and motivates them to actually make the change. So, uh, you know, that's, that's where I, I'm trying to go with my part of the, of, of the speech roadmap overall. And then I see a lot of uh, real-time stuff coming out. You know, you're seeing more and more. When you first bought speech, you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't buy a library of detection, if you would. Now there's more and more of that coming from the provider. So it's, you know, a lot of people here have probably deployed a workforce tool and, you know, had to build all their own schedule sets or deployed a dialer and had to come up with all your own dialer rules and those types of things. I think you're going to see more and more kind of a turnkey approach from the, the large platform providers as well. Yeah, and, and some of the uh, companies that I work with are, are you know, they're, they're doing some really leading edge stuff where they're, we, we start talking about sentiment. And, you know, when, when I first heard, you know, uh, you know, sentiment analysis on speech, I'm like, okay, that, you know, I, I mean, sentiment is, you know, it means a lot of different things to a lot of people, um, but true sentiment analysis is, is, is becoming a real thing where, you know, it's detecting the meaning of the word versus just the word itself. And, and so you're gonna start seeing that uh, here in the next few months with some, uh, some leading edge companies uh, in the industry that are you know, about to make some announcements. So that's kind of exciting to, to see. But yeah, Dan's right. You gotta, you gotta combine you know, multiple data sets uh, into the speech. And it's not, you know, we started talking about speech. Don't just think this is voice because this really is all about the transcripts uh, that come out. So the voice gets transcribed and the analytics engines you know, look at those words and those words have to be accurate. So the accuracy of the transcriptions are, are, are mm. a big thing. Um, where people, uh, you know, sometimes they misunderstand. It's like, you know, it's, it's not really just speech. It's the transcriptions that are that are coming out, and you can you can cycle through transcriptions extremely easy. You know, I mean, that's where the technology comes in. That's where you need your IT folks. You know, you download those, you you export those uh, WAV files uh, and those transcriptions into a JSON file. Now you've got your um, IT folks going through and and plugging in. Uh, you know, you know, in a mass quantity, searching for various keywords and phrases, and being able to kick you out of report based on uh, based on that. Well, wow. yeah, I'd say there's one more thing, Shane. You, you always do this to give me a, another idea. There, there's this verticalization sure. piece going on too. You look at Microsoft bought Nuance, and the reason they did that, you know, or you know, I, I'm not. Bill Gates or whoever, but um, the reason they did that was really for the practice in, in medical. So you're going to see more and more specific kind of, we'll call them dictionaries or libraries, being able to detect things, you know, so all these drug names and things like that. And then, so they're going deeper within verticals, I think, the technology providers and the people writing the engines. And then on top of that, there's a widening of the vertical. So speech analytics, maybe the DOD used it originally, and then contact centers kind of globbed onto it. Now you're seeing like Microsoft go, yeah, you know what, every time a doctor reads out on a case study or whatever, you know, they call it after they visit you. And, they, you know, instead of talking to their tape recorder, now they're going to talk in and now we'll use this nuance engine. What kind of information can we extract from that? How can we predict better health outcomes? How can we reduce liabilities for um, malpractice? All those types of ideas. So now you're seeing it go very wide in verticals. And I think as we, as customer experience practitioners, look at servicing these verticals, you know, we, we have this unique job where we have to kind of like really know the business model of everybody and then also be really good at it. So I think is that their companies get better at using that type of data and we can bring it back into our workflows. We'll be able to better service um, those verticals and those brands. Very great point, Dan. Very nice. So where's there, I think at this point, um, we're, I think we're towards the end of our, of our, outline that we identified. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you think we should make the audience aware of within the industry and, and dealing with voice analytics? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if you're going to, you know, summarize this, I mean, you, you, you need, you need patience, you need understanding of the system. Um, you need, uh, you know, some folks who've had some experience with it before, and you really have to figure out what you want to get out of, uh, out of this. I mean, if it's just to automate QA, that's a no-brainer. You can do that, and you can eliminate, you know, to Dan's point, virtually every one of your QA agents who just, you know, who right now are just checking the box, uh, you know, traditionally. But if you're look, hopefully, you know, you, you know, that's an expensive speech can be expensive if you're going to ingest a, a lot of a lot of calls, um, you know. But to Dan's point, there's a there's a reason that uh, you know the speech companies are now starting to partner with the the customer experience organizations. I mean, there's they all see the writing on the wall. 
it's about you know finding out and we and, and I know we talked about real time being good, bad, and different, but it's you know starting to understand the customer problems and customer experience on a on a real time basis. And real time means not waiting seven to ten days to get a survey back and really understanding what's going on uh, you know in the meantime. Mm -hmm. was, I think some of the challenges when you when you launch these things is you know just being able to get proper data out of it. So you do need some folks who understand, you know, SQL or JSON and, and how to take that data and, and turn it into, to, you know, reports that you can give to somebody who you can take actionable insights on. I mean, just doing the QA scorecard, no brainer. That, that's, uh, you can, I, I think yeah, I, I've automated at least 90 to 93% of every QA scorecard I've ever seen in the industry. Um, so you don't need that anymore now, but now it's about taking what's going on within the call and turning it into more of a, you know, actionable item from the C-suite. Yeah. It's like, here's the next level. Yeah. 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 I, Dan, anything uh, to add? yeah. I, I agree. I agree with what Shane's saying too. I think some of the myths out there, you know, you can't do this. It's a very subjective uh, measurement that we have our QA doing. Well, you know, first question is, should you be doing that subjective measurement? But second one is when you start using, you know, what we call multimodal approaches, where we're bringing in different data sets and, you know, was whole time detected. I don't know. Well, we get that from the switch because we know if they press the button on the aspect or a or Cisco or whatever. So, um, you know, some of those things we can absolutely know, but just kind of in conclusion, what I'd say is when you think about what happened in digital transformation recently, especially with the pandemic, virtualizing workforces and then moving, you know, my dad, never, he lives in Wyoming, Shine, Wyoming. He never was going to DoorDash, but because of COVID, he started, door, like, I'm amazed. Like that guy wouldn't even buy anything online. We'll give his credit card number out, you know, just, and, you know, now he's like DoorDashing regularly or whatever it is. So um, when you think about that, that acceleration of, of the digital transformation that we've all been talking about and proponents of for so long. Um, I'd say, don't be on the fence on this. Like you should jump into it. You don't have to go all in with speech and any type of AI technology. Really. I kind of recommend, you know, I mean, it's not uh, a fad, Dan. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, well, but you know, do it with, you take a crawl, walk around approach kind of a thing. Right. So like, you don't have to go all in and try and have like this, you know, some type of conversational intelligence. that's better than a chat bot on your website, tying it back and telling your agent what to do. Like, you can maybe get there, but take, you know, take one step at a time. And like, you know, I just, how do I reduce percent silence to drive my CSAT up two points or my close rate up, a, you know, 0 0.05 or whatever it is and um, do a smaller sampling and, and make it work. And then, you know, just have it be one step at, after the next. Excellent. Yeah. One, something that's kind of, uh, you know, is not really talked about, but if you've uh, owned call centers as long as uh, Dan and I have and run operations, and I and I, you know, I think the the group that's you know going to be viewing this uh, uh, can maybe attest to is you know agents. Listen, they know that they're not their call, their calls are being randomly picked, and and they don't you know they may, they may get caught for lack of a better terms uh, having a bad call. But if with speech analytics, uh, we've seen behaviors change almost overnight. Uh, especially during training, when you start talking about, listen, we record all of your calls, all the calls are run through speech analytics, we're using them for, you know, enhancement purposes, so it's not a, you know, we're not trying to catch people, do that. I think that's the, 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 the big misnomer in the, in the QA world, uh, contact centers, like, no one's ever coming to you and saying, hey, I just listened to a great call, most of the time it's, hey, I heard this call, here's what you could have done better, so it's, it's very, you know, hammer versus a carrot, uh, so to speak. Um, with speech, you can actually use it for, you know, it should be used as, a, as a, a training enhancement program and not just we heard you doing it, you know, you hear, you know, this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, this is what, you know, we heard. You know, so now you can, you can recommend people and, and commend them for, you know, what we call wild calls or something, you know, something great happening versus just, uh, you know, uh, listen, you, you, we, we caught you doing this. You know, and then, right, because they have to learn to apply the knowledge they have, right, and understand that and that's how they learn it, right? Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. 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 Well, if there's nothing else you'd like to add on. I think we'll, we'll go to some questions that have come in uh, so far on the ticker here. Um, I guess I'll cue the same question up to both of you, see what you think. Uh, so first question come in is, came in and said, so what are the common contact center efficiencies that are easier to uncover by using artificial intelligence and quality management at scale that you can't really do in a manual process? Are there some ways or some things that are better using this type of a solution? Yeah, I mean, I, that's, I mean, the, we, we've talked about it, you know, a couple of times is, is automating 
the scorecard, there's, you know, if, you, if you, that's, that's a no brainer. You can auto automate a QA scorecard. Uh, you, you can listen for, you know, the, all the key greetings and openings and closings, all those things can be automated uh, quickly. Still need human intelligence to, to teach the program what to listen for. But you want to talk about automating, uh, you know, one of the bigger efficiencies and one of the cost savings is, is you know, and now you need one to 200 uh, QA agents versus one to 35. Uh, those are, mm, those that's are huge cool. savings. Yeah. It's huge savings. Yeah. 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 Uh, if I kind of heard the question, the, the way I heard it too is like, what, what can we find in using a technology like this more than the human ears would be able to get? And it's, I mean, there, it's probably everything is the answer on that QA scorecard, but like, Chain use soup calls as an example earlier, right? So I want to speak to your supervisor. Well, sometimes we detect that in training, but like we use this tool, we very quickly see that Dan has a soup call generated every Friday at 3.30 and gets off at four or, you know, whatever it is, you know, we can kind of triangulate against some of those things. So, you know, I think the, the most important ones would be, again, the compliance kind of pieces, you know, are you, do you know every time somebody says something about uh, put me on your do not call list on your current calls? You probably don't if you only have a human QA, but if you have speech, it would be much easier to get to closer to 100% of that. And that makes company lawyers much happier, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, see, the next question that came in. Um, so in your experience, uh, what are the necessary parts of a successful deployment and long-term adaptation of AI? I think, I think it was Shane, you mentioned at the beginning, right? There's a lot of people who have bought an AI platform, put it in place, didn't quite understand it, and then walked away from it. So how do you... How do you find traction and how do you really find some real value in this uh, from an implementation side? Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's, uh, I, you know, the same, same thing we've been discussing is you, you've really got to be patient with it. You've got to understand what you want to get out of it. Um, it it's, you know, it's not the new, it's the new shiny toy on the block, so to speak. Uh, so, so you got to know it. And there's a lot to choose from uh out there so understanding what you want to get out of it i think just with any technology uh you know you, you purchase it you know should be should be done front but um you know talk to folks who have been using it uh because they, they will tell you the good bad and, and ugly of, of launching a a speech analytics program uh you know dan's done it on a much higher scale than i have but but i think the, the parts and the processes are the same regardless if you have a 50 c call center or a 25,000 c call center You've got to have an understanding of what you want to do with it, what you want to get out of it, uh, and then re, you know allocate the proper resources uh, for it. It's same, very same thing with customer journey analytics, right? Is you know people mm -hmm. do you know journey mapping, and they they realize that oh my gosh, there, there's data regard you know that we have to co coagulate all this data together and correlate data. What do we do with it? Where do we get it? And who's going to do that? And then what? And then more importantly. You know, data has to tell a story. So, what story are you going to be able to tell with that, and who's going to tell that story? Yeah, I say it's just my piece on this. Is Shane spot on? I think having the business objectives and outcomes in mind when you start this, so you know what you're going after, and you can shape that. The, the classic: don't boil the ocean, and then um, the resourcing piece too. One thing I'd say I learned um, in the wrong ways is taking people with a lot of business acumen or context inner acumen and thinking they could use this technology. I, I think you absolutely need to take, and Shane said this earlier, you need people that are more developer mindset or programmers, and you should pair those folks with the, you need both the business acumen and the technical acumen to have this and probably take whatever resources you think you need and, you know, multiply that by 1.25 or 1.5 or something like that. Very good. All right, here's another question that came in. This one, I'll send this one to you first, Dan. I went twice to Shane. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, to ensure that agents are growing, this is an interesting question. Um, what model of quality monitoring would help achieve both a better agent performance, but also a better, better customer experience, right? Because you're they're two tied together, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think they're they're tied together. I think people have proven that. If not, we all believe it at this point. Um, so I think being able to consume it easily and make, you know, we talk about customer ease a lot. We should talk about employees a lot. I think people are beginning to do that more and more. So um, to me, it's when we have the data set in speech, doing the extra work. So, you know, let's make our own algorithm or just do it in Excel or whatever you do it, do the regression analysis to understand of all the things we're detecting, what's most important. Because classically, when I've come into a speech consulting engagement, I'll walk in and someone will hand me some score, a scorecard, a bunch of people sent in a boardroom and made. And it's like, use the caller's name three times or whatever. Like, does that really drive results? Well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So prove that first. And I think if you get, 
if we measure the things that actually move the business outcomes, reducing the, the churn on the call if I'm in retentions or driving the sale or whatever it may be that the high level business outcome is, and we can communicate that to the employees, that employee experience and customer experience, the unification you talked about happens because when they start doing things, they see the results on their scorecard and their managers are happy and everything comes downstream. So that's probably the most important kind of key I'd say is take the extra time to figure out if what you're measuring actually moves the needle on your, your main KPIs. Excellent, yeah. Shane, anything to add? Yeah, yeah no, I, you know, it, it's more about, um, you know, the whole agent experience. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in this and it's something that's, uh, that everybody talks about, but it's, you know, put into action is, is usually, you know, more talk than action, uh, so to speak, is, is that agents right now just want to, you know, people, you know, these are, these are adults for the most part, right? They, they, sometimes they don't act like it, but they are, these are adults and they want to learn. They don't want to be talked to, uh, you know, in a specific way. They want to understand what's happening. So if you communicate with agents, you know, on an ongoing basis about what, about what's happening. Hey, listen, we, you know, every time you say these words or every time, you know, these words are said on calls, it turns into a conversion. So these are the, these, instead of the old water cooler days of, you know, agents get on, get in a, a, a break room and they start talking about, hey, I said this and it worked, right? But now you can prove it in speech and, and you can, you can really show them the actions because what happens at the, at the agent level is they get, they get, you know, coached or, or, you know, uh, spoken to with their supervisor or a QA agent, you know, maybe once a week or whatever, unless they have a problem. So there's no real communication flow to them. So speech allows you to, you know, you can automate this too. So it goes out to them on an email, they can review it. You don't have to wait for, for somebody to talk to and then they can do it on their, on their own real time. I know Dan's a big advocate of, uh, you know, adult learning uh, principles. And, and those are some of the things that I think can, um, can really start driving efficiencies and really improve the agent uh, experience, which is which ultimately trickles down into improving the customer experience. That's really interesting. And that, this is a question that I just came up with based on your two answers uh, that you just gave. So is there a preferred initial target of agent training versus customer experience tracking that leads to better, quicker results? Or is there is it company dependent, as you said earlier, right? They have different objectives and things they want to obtain. Dan, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, I'm thinking for a second because I, I think it is somewhat, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's, I'm thinking, is it company dependent, vertical dependent? It, to me, it's almost like size of the operation dependent, I think. Ah, okay. You know, because like, I think it's much easier to get adoption and, and I've done this, you know, I've done some big speech programs where you're in like literally 25 shops and, you know, some are hundred seats and some are 5,000 seats. And you, no matter what, and all that, you know, if you normalize that data, if you were to look at it and stand back, you'd say, well, it's interesting because it's kind of the standard bell curve. You got, you know, some soups that just took to this like ducks to water and they're driving the implementation. It's rocking. And you got other people that are like, you know, revolting, but, um, so I think, I'm not sure I know the answer, but I, my gut is saying, I think it's more on the employee side because the adoption is everything because that's where you have all the intelligence in the world, but if you can't execute on it, you know, you're not going to change anything. So I almost think it's the employee side if I had to pick one of the two. Interesting. Shane? Yeah, I'd, I'd, probably, I'd probably lean on that as well, down that direction. Interesting. Very good. Very good. Uh, well, we, I think we keep getting questions in. I, I think we're towards the end of the session time. So what I think we may be doing is that Dan and Shane, you'll get these questions after the conference and be able to respond back uh, to email on the, on the people who have asked them. But uh, I want to thank you both for your great conversation and uh, it's a real pleasure to chat with you and you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And